thank you very much for this uh, stimulating comment. I'd like uh, now to compliment our interdisciplinary tour uh, from political philosophy uh, via politics, political ecology, and compliment it with a few from international law. And I'd like to give Ms. Feichner the, the floor for her considerations. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd also like to thank um, Karin Kübelberg and Werner Ratzer for having invited me to Vienna. Um, it's a great honor for me to comment on the thoughts of Thomas Pogge, whom I admire greatly for the combination of radical critique and pragmatic proposals for policy reform. As an international lawyer, I will concentrate on the following few issues. First, I would like to take a closer look at what Pogge calls the resource privilege and ask whether it is supported by international law. Second, I second what I interpret as Thomas Pogge's admonition of international lawyers to treat questions of resource fairness more comprehensively and in a more contextualized manner. And third, I turn very briefly to Pogge's concrete proposals to express my fear that they may undermine the calls for democratization that are also part of Pogger's work. First, the resource privilege. The resource privilege, according to Pogger, is a fundamental flaw in the current distribution order for natural resources. He formulates it as follows, I quote, any person or group that succeeds in exercising effective power in a country is recognized as entitled to confer legally valid ownership rights in this country's resources, regardless of how such a person or group may have come to power. This formulation suggests that international law is indifferent to how a gov government came into power and accords to any government in power the right to dispose over a nation's natural wealth. Yet this interpretation needs to be qualified in light of the history. No, oh, sorry. A closer look at the central international law principle for the allocation of rights over natural resources mandates a qualification of this formulation. This principle is the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources. It can be interpreted to mean that the state on whose territory natural resources are located may freely dispose over these resources. Thus interpreted, it supports Pogge's formulation of the resource privilege. As under international law, also undemocratic and authoritarian governments are recognized as exercising sovereignty, those governments can also dispose of a country's natural wealth. Yet, this interpretation needs to be qualified in light of the history of this principle as well as current human rights doctrine. In the course of decolonization, the newly independent states fought strongly for the recognition of permanent sovereignty over natural resources. As such, it is closely connected to the right to self-determination. It is not only directed against other states that shall not have any claims over resources located within the territory of another state. It was, at the time it was established, also directed against the colonial powers and clarified that also peoples still under colonial rule enjoyed sovereignty over their natural resources. This aspect becomes clear from the wording of the principle in Resolution 1803 of 1962, and I cite, the rights of peoples and nations to permanent sovereignty over their natural wealth and resources must be exercised in the interest of their nat national development and of the well-being of the people of the state concerned. The principle could thus also be referred to as the legal basis for reparation claims for spoliation during colonial rule. Yet these claims, as we know, were largely unsuccessful. The formulation of the principle in this resolution, as well as its inclusion in both international human rights covenants, also clarifies the connection to human rights. Permanent sovereignty over natural resources must be exercised in the interest of the well-being of the people. The Banjul Charter, the African Convention of Human Rights, is even more explicit. It stipulates that, and I cite, in case of spoliation, the dispossessed people shall have the right to the lawful recovery of its property as well as to an adequate compensation. Given that sovereignty over natural resources is part of the right to self-determination, 
and needs to be interpreted in light of human rights, I would like to maintain the resource privilege does not find its basis in today's international law. And yet, I do not want to argue that international law is innocent as regards what in short can be denoted as the resource curse. This brings me to point two of my comment, that international law needs to deal more comprehensively and in a more contextualized manner with questions of resource fairness. Pogge again and again alerts us to the fact that rich countries are implicated in the misery of the poor, that we have a causal and moral responsibility as the international economic order has largely been constructed by rich states. An order that allows us to benefit from the exploitation of natural resources in resource-rich, poor states, while their populations bear the costs of unstable and authoritarian government, environmental degradation and stagnating growth. These are accusations that appear to directly address international lawyers. Is not much of this order based on and constructed by law, including international law? And yet, it appears so difficult for international lawyers who often understand themselves as the agents of peace and progress to identify the responsibility of international law. Instead, we point, as I just did, to what some call humanities law, the legal elements and doctrines that pervade all international legal regimes and that aim at the realization of equity and human rights. Pointing to international law's endorsement of human rights, we can argue that it is not international law that is the problem. It may be weak and disregarded by powerful actors, but this is hardly to be blamed on the international legal order. And yes, of course, there is room for improvement for further human rights clauses in regional trade and investment agreements, for example. It was the great contribution of the critical legal studies movement to point out the respects in which international law is itself part of the problem. And I understand Thomas Pogge to call on us to continue this work, to identify to what extent international law as a major building block of the international economic order contributes to the existing injustices. In order to do this, it is necessary, I believe, to overcome the compartmentalization which so often characterizes legal scholarship and like Pogge take a more comprehensive view and pay attention to context. To return to the resource privilege, in order to fully understand why illegitimate governments can sell out their country's natural wealth and how law enables them to do this, we need to look at the interplay of different legal regimes. Thus, we may see how a transnational resource order has developed with the help of international, national and private law in which the governments of many importing countries are not directly involved in resource trade and thus can eschew responsibility. In which these same governments can rely on private actors, in particular transnational enterprises, to satisfy their needs for resources and in which these private actors benefit from and are protected by international law, such as investment and trade law, while at the same time not being obliged by international law norms, for example, to protect the environment or human rights. In short, international lawyers interested in understanding international law's contribution to global injustice need to adopt a transnational law approach. A transnational law approach in two senses. First, in that they define their subject of inquiry with respect to transnational problems such as inequality in the distribution of costs and benefits of natural resource exploitation. Second, that they not only look at international law, but widen their view to include national and private law in their inquiries, so that, for example, can, they can better relate the sale of gas at the local gas station to the concession contract between the Nigerian government and Shell. Just as it is a democracy, democracy deficit if citizens do not understand important foreign policy and international practices, such a lack of understanding is a scholarly deficit of a discipline that, like international law, is characterized by a high degree of utopianism. Which brings me to my last point, Pogge's pragmatic proposals and their relationship with calls for democratization. First, I would like to stress how much I appreciate 
that Pogge combines his fundamental critique with very specific institutional proposals based on a multidimensional assessment of their potential effects, as well as prospects for realization. International lawyers interested in institutional reform surely can learn a great deal from him. Yet I feel some unease when reading, for example, the suggestions for containing the borrowing and resource privileges of authoritarian governments. With respect to the resource privilege, his proposal calls for constitutional amendments to the effect that only democratic governments may effect legally valid transfers of ownership. So far, so good, and similar provisions do exist, I believe. The Bolivian Constitution of 2009, for example, includes a provision which reads like this. The natural resources are the property and direct domain, indivisible and without limitation, of the Bolivian people, and the state is mandated with their administration in the collective interest. Yet, Pogge does not end here. To take account of the frequent problems to distinguish an undemocratic from a democratic government, Pogge suggests the establishment of an external agency, a democracy panel, staffed with legal experts to make determinations about the democratic qualities of governments. And in the realm of odious debt, a further institution might be necessary, an international democratic loan guarantee fund. It is the beauty of these proposals that they are specific and that they attempt to preempt all sorts of counter arguments. Moreover, Pogge stresses himself that he does not favor too much centralization nor the establishment of a global welfare bureaucracy. And still, regarding these, reading these proposals, I cannot help but be reminded of the critique Sundia Pahuja recently formulated of post-colonial international law. For her, international law's focus on economic development undermined the promise of political self-determination that international law had held for the peoples freed from colonial rule. International law's technocratic expert rule came to replace law's promise of justice. I cite Pahuja, economic growth and development came to displace a more open-ended and politically contested notion of justice as law's horizon. Following Pahuja, I would like to conclude with my fear, which I also hold to be the greatest challenge for international law, that global justice translated into institutional recipes may come to displace a more open-ended and contested notion of global justice. <laughs>